everybody. Um, Tyler, Bryant, Mary, and I are presenting on climate change adaptation in the Gunnison Basin, specifically focusing on the Upper Gunnison Basin Riparian Restoration and Resilience Project. Um, just a, an overview of our presentation here. We want you to know that our primary interest and in kind of research questions in this project are really asking how is a project for climate change adaptation of this magnitude managed? Um, and also, what does it take to see a project like this through, from the planning phases through to implementation? So I'll be talking about the background process and kind of the planning process that led up to it. Um, Bryant will talk about project goals and different phases. Mary will talk about coordination, um, funding, and challenges there. And Tyler will talk about long-term implementation uh, and the capacity building of the project, which is a major aspect of any project like this, and then we'll kind of give some recommendations uh, and suggestions for next steps that the project might want to use. So I'm looking at the background process. Um, one of my primary, two of my primary questions were, you know, why the Gunnison Basin and why this particular project? And it really begins with the Nature Conservancy, whose mission is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. And the vision of the Nature Conservancy really brings in the humans as stewards component of that mission. So in 2008, the Nature Conservancy began the Southwest Climate Change Initiative, whose mission was to provide information and tools to build the resilience of natural areas in Arizona, Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico. Uh, the first primary goal of this initiative was to bring together efforts by the Nature Conservancy for a service the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis and the Wildlife Conservation Society and developing frame, frameworks um, for impact assessment, vulnerability assessment, and adaptation. So each of these organizations were kind of developing frameworks independently and the Nature Conservancy recognized that and wanted to streamline those efforts. So the first step after bringing them together was to really streamline those efforts um, and the first step was to identify case studies throughout the Southwest where they could apply those efforts. So the Gunnison Basin was identified as a viable area for a case study for a number of reasons, a few of which I'll list. Um, so the initiative, the Southwest Climate Change Initiative, did a rapid regional climate change assessment and identified the basin as having high exposure to climate change and also having a large number of species vulnerable to climate change. Um, it also recognized that the Gunnison Basin was part of, is part of the Colorado River Basin, which identified as the epicenter of warming in the United States, and also realized that ongoing efforts in clim long-term climate research and monitoring um, at Rumble, Western, and CPW, uh, the basin as a case study could nicely dovetail with those efforts. Um, and there were also lots of opportunities for strengthening existing um, collaborative networks. So the next step was to hold a workshop to really bring together a lot of the adaptation actors in the basin. This workshop was held in 2009, and it brought together lots of public and private entities, um, some of which are listed right there, um, including the BLM, the Forest Service, the National Park Service, Gunnison County, uh, and many others. Uh, the, the workshop focused on three primary areas of concern, <coughs> Gunnison sage-grouse, alpine wetlands, and Gunnison headwaters. And the way the workshop worked is breakout groups fo were focusing on each primary area of concern, and the Western Water Assessment and the National Center for Atmospheric Research proposed um, two different climate scenarios for which each breakout group reviewed different vulnerabilities given either climate scenario. Um, and then moved on to developing adaptation strategies for either climate scenario. So that was a major outcome of that workshop. Another outcome of the workshop kind of moving forward was to convene a group called the Gunnison Climate Working Group, which just kept together a lot of those entities that were at the workshop. Um, and some major deliverables from the working group over the past couple of years were a more in-depth ecological vulnerability assessment of the basin, um, partly based on that workshop and what the workshop came up with, um, and a social resilience and vulnerability assessment um, done by Dr. Corey Knapp, um, and continued as well by other folks. Um, and the, the work of the Gunnison Climate Working Group is still ongoing today. I'll pass it off to Brian now. All right.
Thank you, John. So I'm going to talk to you guys about the goals of this project and like many of the adaptation uh, print, uh, strategies that we've been presented here, they kind of start with these broad visions and then kind of get narrowed down into missions and then actionable goals and steps to create those. And with, with this project, it's really been the, the Nature Conservancy and I've had the opportunity to speak with Betsy Mealy for this project and, and she's been this driving force behind it and continues to be so. And it's just interesting to see their initial vision for this um, was enhance viability and integrity of conservation targets and abate the threats to those targets. So that's an interesting statement as in they're talking about abating or removing the threats which is really a mitigation strategy, not necessarily an adaptation strategy. And it wasn't until they went through this kind of process of the Denison Climate Working Group and um, the vulnerability assessments as John was talking about that they kind of evolved into this idea of restoration as an adaptation strategy. Um, and it's interesting to see how these, how these uh, visions and goals and, and mission statements kind of change in a, in, um, about and adapt along the way. And so with the Gunnison Climate Working Group, um, their initial goals were to increase awareness of the effects of climate change on, na on nature and people, develop and prioritize adaptive strategies for addressing vulnerability to climate change, and promote coordinate, coordinated action in the Upper Gunnison Basin. And so with those are pretty broad in scale, but both social and ecological, and kind of maybe more of a next step down from uh, the broader vision that you know is kind of the, the start of it all. Um, so out of that Gunnison kind of Climate Working Group, they kind of identify these wet meadows as their target restoration, right? And so they kind of entered into this phase one, which the phase one is really uh, the pilot project and really where the rubber meets the road. And this is where they actually tried to go out and, and, and see what they could do on the ground. And they had uh, their specific goals for phase one, which was roughly 2012-2013 period, uh, was restore and enhance resilience of brood rearing habitat for the Gunnison sage grouse, as well as wintering habitat for elk and deer. Establish a repeatable process that can be duplicated throughout the basin and establish economical monitoring programs and share tools and methods. So they've identified specific ecological goals, specific animals, and then also they've kind of started to try and identify this idea of what this program can look like and then also this idea of kind of spreading it through the basin. And along with that, they, you know, they, they went to the, they took that to the lowest level where they actually identified goals for the specific wet metal restoration projects where, you know, uh, uh, spreading water out on these floodplains, uh, stopping active erosion, and just basically increasing the size and the overall health of these riparian areas. Um, and so, with the wrapping up of phase one, they really saw they really saw a lot of good results. They really liked what they saw from phase one. They saw very visually rapid responses in these treatment areas in the wet meadows. But not only that, in line with their goals, they also uh, were able to build this social capacity, the partnerships they made, the connections, the processes they went through in actually building these things. They felt like they had a really good understanding and they wanted to try and make this, move this into the next phase, which is what we're currently in now. So right now we're kind of in the second year of phase two, um, uh, where they've gotten more funding to try and continue these projects. And phase two kind of has their own set of goals, and in there to increase ecosystem resilience to climate change by restoring hydrologic function of priority wet meadows and riparian habitats. Build a sustainable and enduring program to increase restoration across the basin and ensure scientific rigor of projects, develop and evaluate cost-effective tools, methods, and planning, share best practices and lessons learned to encourage application of restoration methods within and outside the basin. So now they've kind of taken those goals they had in phase one where they really kind of looked at the programming within the basin and they were looking at these specific ecological indicators of sage grouse, the deer, the elk, and they've kind of broadened that a little bit and, and to include climate resilience, of, uh, resilience to climate change um, by restoring hydrologic function. A uh, little bit of a shift there. I mean, both still social and ecological goals in nature, and they also have this idea of not only spreading this knowledge and, and these programs within the basin, but now looking to the next step, spreading those outside the basin into a regional scale. Um, so with all these phases, um, and with any goals, they're looking at monitoring. And so what they've chosen to use as their metrics for monitoring is very ecological in nature. Um, they've met other goals of social capacity just in the steps along the way and going through the different phases of building these partnerships. But mainly they focus in on ecological indicators. And so for currently they have 420 uh, monitoring uh, or photo points set up, 138 uh, point 
line intercept transect set up and uh, eight groundwater monitoring wells, two study sites where they're looking at water and soil, uh, soil temperature and water, and a couple of long-term uh, uh, time-lapse camera sites, as well as uh, trying to plan for the future of monitoring. They're looking at this idea of economical, and in line with their goals for phase two is this economical idea of uh, scaling up their monitoring to be successful with the project. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to them. Um, so I'm going to look at project coordination. So the wildlife or the wildlands restoration volunteers, they kind of spearhead of the entire coordination of volunteers. Um, so most of their projects are entirely volunteer based. Um, and they provide a lot of extensive um, leadership training programs, which provide really great skills for these volunteers to use in other areas of their life. Um, and they also really do try to engage the community on some of these conservation issues. So they started in 1999 with just 20 volunteers, and at the end of 2011, they had ranked up 234,000 volunteer hours, which is valued at over $4.4 million worth of service work. Um, so the Western Colorado Conservation Corps, um, this organization really does try to put an effort into having local crew members and local um, crew leaders in order to keep that you know, knowledge in the, in the area. Um, so both these organizations are really vital to the project. However, the Nature Conservancy does coordinate and organize all the um, project efforts and um, everything that goes into the project. So just to look at some of the current, current status of the project, um, <clears throat> there's been 476 structures that have been built. Uh, 68 acres have been restored along 14.5 stream miles at five different priority sites between 2012 and 2014. Um, these treatments have enhanced approximately 585 acres of gunnison, sage, grouse, brooding, brood rearing habitat. Okay, so just to look at some of their before and after photos, this you can see a cattle trail right there, and this is where they put a, um, a drift fence in 2013. This is at West Flat Top on US Forest Service lands. Um, so what they wanted to do, can you switch things on? So you can see with this fence, uh, they were diverting cattle uh, from their natural trail to reduce trailing and the soil compaction so that you can actually get some growth in there. So that's pretty impressive. So this one is, if anyone remembers looking for the media luna at the end of our um, project that where we went out to uh, Wolf Creek Ranch Meadow, we were trying to find where this was at the end of the trip and we couldn't find it. Well, this is what it looks like. Um, That's what it looked like in 2012, 2013, and then 2014. So this is probably why we couldn't find it when we were <laughs> driving by. Um, so they, they use this in order to spread water across the drying meadow. Um, so they're trying to increase native plants like sedges and reduce those invasive species like the thistle. Um, so to look at funding. Um, so this is the top funding is kind of looking at the CPW's um, budget as well as leveraged funds which came from the Wildlife Conservation Society. But if you look down here, this is the total project budget, which was $218,000. And that's budgeting that they've, you know, allotted for this project. This does not include any of the in-kind um, services or donations that we've had, um, which has been pretty significant. Um, and. Uh, so these are some of our other partner contributions, and I'll just kind of list all the other kind of in-kind donations that this project has received. So Gunnison Gravel, as well as Earth Moving, provided 631 cubic yards of rock over the course of three years. Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation gave $5,000 for rock supplies. The U.S. Forest Service, BLM, and CPW provided in-kind services of staff time, oversight of field crews, and expertise on the project. Um, the WCCC had youth field crews out there working for two weeks this last summer um, in order to stage rocks. The CPW provided Miller Ranch, which we got to use when we volunteered. Um, and they also provided a UTV for hauling rock, a four-wheel drive vehicle for volunteer events. Uh, the National Park Service provided dump trucks for transporting rocks to different sites. Gunnison County uh, provided meeting space, landowner contracts, and technical support. Uh, the Upper Gunnison River Water Conservancy District 
provided sworn meeting places, uh, funding for rock supplies, assistance with recruiting volunteers in different outreach activities. So, pretty neat stuff. So we've looked at um, the process of planning such a large scale restoration project. Uh, we looked at identified goals and desired outcomes and all the coordination that went into this. But as we said, we're in second year of phase two of a three year project and ideally it doesn't end there either. So um, they've identified some steps going forward to just keep um, building these projects. The first one in general is just scaling it up. You know, we've had five priority sites that we worked on some of last year. Um, using GIS site selection analysis to prioritize treatments, they've come up with six more to work on this year that range everywhere from Harlan all the way to Blue Mesa across the basin. And then, you know, there's all these satellite populations too, which um, in many cases are the reason for listing. Um, so trying to duplicate these efforts in satellite populations as well. And also just expand on existing treatments that we all worked on. Um, and then a key thing is that, as Barry here can attest to, you know, we put a lot of sweat into making these structures. And they're really solid structures, but they require maintenance, especially after the first major precipitation event. So going back and looking at the ones we've already built and making sure um, that they're maintaining the function. And then also, importantly, continue monitoring. Um, we've already seen some pretty good changes, uh, but it's going to be more evident over time. And all of these reports that we've seen have explicitly stated a desire to work with Western faculty and students to adapt, launch, and moderate, which Sam Rowland here has taken up and will be looking for her project at um, the effect of these um, structures on influencing the aquatic vegetation, that, or uh, aquatic insects that the sage grouse young need in the first couple weeks of their life. Um, and then that takes us to this idea of capacity building. Um, so one of the goals, ecological goal, was just to build the capacity of sage grouse to deal with climate change and degraded habitat, but also for, to build the capacity of us humanoids to work together to repair these degraded landscapes. And if you guys remember, um, vulnerability was kind of this come together of sensitivity, exposure, and adaptive capacity. So if we can build our adaptive capacity, we can reduce the vulnerability of these sage grouse. Um, and some of the ways that they're building adaptive capacity for this project include Training more crew leaders um, and really engaging the community at all levels, as young as high school students even. Uh, we talked to George Sibley and Frank Kugel, and one of their really strong recommendations for that they really want to see more efforts to train younger kids um, to the point of hiring, George wanted to hire an education coordinator um, and also just get high schoolers out into these areas. He envisioned basically, you know, the entire town really view of going out for a watershed weekend and looking at these things and really just more engaging more localized leadership from schools, from agencies, from landowners. Um, and that really helps train volunteers. As we talked about, this is a huge volunteer effort that really requires massive amounts of volunteers uh, to reduce the costs of this. So um, just identifying ways to make the volunteer program sustainable, uh, which comes a lot from the Wildland Restoration Volunteers and WCCC, who last year uh, helped for two weeks staging rock, um, but have really ramped up their efforts or are going to this year. They've committed 10 weeks specifically to working on this project. And there's just a huge, lots of energy from volunteers, and so just coordinating all of them and making sure that they're around for the lifetime of this project. And then also, you know, we talked about how the Nature Conservancy really has helped coordinate all of this and funded a lot of it. Um, and going forward, I don't think we can expect them to continue to operate in that capacity. So um, finding additional partners, additional funding sources, and really localized leaders to, to the project. And then just in general, sharing the information that comes from the planning of this, the implementing of this, and the monitoring of this, uh, which they've done a really good job with so far. They've taken done lots of field trips um, with partners out to these sites that show the effective outcomes, uh, presentations, reports, and just sharing and also sharing these this information with other working groups in Crawford and Ponce Springs and San Miguel uh, who are facing similar issues. And then just in general, trust building on the effectiveness of these projects. It is sort of the new science. Bill Zedike has been doing this thing all across New Mexico and Arizona a lot, but up here it's um, sort of a new thing. 
And then also there has been, I think, some hesitation from ranchers and landowners. Um, it's kind of almost an accusational tone when you go out there and you say, you know, we've identified that you have degraded habitat on your landscape, you know, we want to come in and fix that for you. But really just framing that as in, you know, this, a lot of this is climate change driven and it's really, you know, cost effective and we can restore these, these lands, these uh, habitat for the benefit of sage grouse and also for the benefit of the ranchers. Um, so that kind of brings us full circle, so that's kind of where it's headed and we've come up with a few recommendations we thought uh, maybe some gaps in uh, how to continue this project going forward. Yeah, so just one thing that I would maybe suggest that the Gunnison Climate Working Group adopt a, an adaptive management framework where, you know, maybe X number of years down the road, they have some mechanism to evaluate efficacy of this particular project and determine whether it's still the best, you know, broadest reaching project for the ecology and society of the basin and whether or not to continue with that or maybe switch gears and go on a different path. You know, and just kind of to add to that, you know, I would recommend they have all these metrics for evaluating the, the success on the ground, these wet meadow restorations, but they're really looking at a basin scale, watershed scale. And so how do you measure success at a watershed scale, building that resilience in there? Not only are there any easy answers there, but to try and identify some sort of metrics or some way to evaluate whether it's actually trying to get at what, you know, what they're trying to get at, I think would, would be very important in trying to establish a long-term success of projects. Um, the next one is to target more projects in the proximity of these um, satellite communities, um, just to create like a more cohesive and large scale project. Um, and then the last one is just maybe to be more proactive um, in targeting some of these, or, you know, trying to prevent these habitats from being degraded in the first place. You look at how costly it is to go in and restore these habitats, um, and maybe just identifying ways to prevent that from happening in the first place, like these uh, drift fences that prevent trailing in the first place and stop it from erosion and channelization. So just being more proactive. Questions? My question is in regards to you. They have any monitoring system to actually look for it? It seems like kind of the ultimate goal is this helping save grouse, is this bringing grouse back to their habitats? Is there any sort of monitoring system they have in place for that yet? I, I you know, I was able to ask that question to, like, actually at the last Bear Coalition conference uh, uh, last November, and you know, they're, they're not using grouse metrics or any other like animal population as like their as their definitive, yeah, to move forward, you know. They don't really have a very good idea of how to try and measure the success of this across the watershed. And there's so much that goes into that. You know, if you look at the yeah. Ohio Creek Valley, development is really affecting their numbers. Uh, predators, you talk about foxes and coyotes and uh, crows. So it's really, it would be hard to correlate with what we're talking about with actual sage grouse numbers on the landscape. But, you know, the thought is that if you sort of provide good habitat, they will come. In terms of sort of the financial and the resource element, I mean, you talked about the importance of capacity building, but from your conversations with people that have been engaged, do they feel like there's the momentum to scale up, and, it, and is there the funding to scale up? There is. I think that the partners have been, I mean, they have received so, so many things from the community, and I think that there is a willingness, and there is funding there, they just have to, you know, and they've even scaled up the WCCC this summer, you know, two weeks. I think that, like, we're coming to, like, a really great, you know, moving forward and getting this really ramped up. So I do think that it's possible. And they also want to really identify more cost-effective ways to do this. Um, that was one of the things George and Frank talked about also, is that they helped uh, pay for all the rock that was hauled in from kind of far away at the outside the basin. Um, and identifying local sources and even other sources, you know, we talked about using like wood, beetle kill trees even, um, I'm not sure the effectiveness of <coughs> just identifying more about the And uh, also that, to add to that, you know, going to the sage grass strategic committee meetings, uh, we really see often they, they mention, you know, 
talking about the project is a, is a specific agenda item uh, for those meetings, um, and those are you know broad, you know cross scale coalition, uh, and there's a lot of support in that you know, for the project as well. So that's a good sign. You know, I, I, I just add to you know you look at those pictures of the, of the recovery of the wet meadows. I mean that speaks volumes, and people see that, and that's a very visceral thing for people to latch onto, and it's such such an obvious effect. I think you know I think there is a lot of potential for this to to, to keep gaining traction. Yeah, Matazzi. Uh, just building upon Corey's question, so um, I mean, is there have they modeled any kind of like return on investment, and are they also looking at like how, how can you are you talking about long term metrics uh, looking at the social vulnerability and how, they, how are they meeting those needs? You, you know, that's a, that's a great question. I think it goes back to the idea I was, I was saying about these about trying to measure that the success of these across a watershed scale, and, and there's there's not really any good way that they've identified it, to my knowledge of, of being able to see the cost benefit analysis of this. I mean, with the, their, their cost benefit analysis is those pictures of the grass. And that's that's literally where, where we're at with it. We, we know that on an ecological basis that this is, is a good thing for these systems. Um, but how do we how do we compare this strategy to something else? That's that's kind of the next, that's kind of the fight into the future of this project. Understanding that question. And one, one thing that uh, George Sidley mentioned, and that Frank Kugel, who's the manager of the water district, is pretty seemed kind of concerned about, is the fact that it hasn't really been thought about or um, you know, the effect of these structures in the basin. We understand that it might be a positive effect, but how is that going to affect water users downstream in the lower Gunnison Basin um, if we are? basically keeping more water in our basin. So they were concerned with the legality of that as well. So regarding legality, uh, with the ESA's listing, how does this actually look on that scale? Um, will the federal, federal government ultimately be able to come in and either prevent or encourage actions like this? I know it, it seems like they do have some federal and uh, some state agency volunteers in there. I'm just wondering where the jurisdiction ultimately down the I don't know if anybody knows this. They do, from the um, working with the uh, Sage-Gas Committee, the meetings we've been going to, they do now have to basically run all of this through the Fish and Wildlife Service. So they are, there is oversight, and that was kind of a thorn in the side, it seemed like, from the CPW show. Sure. So it does, it does definitely change. The Fish and Wildlife Service at those meetings, the representatives definitely expressed uh, willingness to continue these projects. They, you know, they saw these as a, as a huge benefit and wanted to try to see what we could do to continue the project so they may become a, a bigger partner in the projects in, in, in the future. But by funding ultimately too, maybe? You know, I would think so. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Um, well, most of these projects are done on private land, private properties. What um, percentage is done on, on public it's property? It's kind of across the board, actually. Uh, the five that we worked on last year, I think, Two were on private property, um, and then a couple on forest service, and a couple on BLM, or one on BLM. Um, and that is the real the goal: is to keep it sort of across land ownership and really bring everybody in. Is this technique used on uh, grazing land, or is it just forest land? Yeah, you know the whole the whole. The whole idea behind these work and behind Bill Zedike's work, and I encourage you to learn more about him, he's an amazing individual, but his whole idea is let water do the work. So there has to be some water on the landscape for these, for these projects for his techniques to actually use. So in grazing in the West, it's usually riparian or wet meadows. Um, I would be hard to like transfer these types of projects to you know just an arid upland kind of thing that doesn't have that uh, water, initial water there to begin with. Well, one more question. And online folks, can you hear online folks? Yeah, we should be able to. Jump in if you have a question. And I actually have, I have one that's kind of a follow-up for that. I, I'm really curious, so at the very beginning when I was a part of the effort, there was a lot of concern about these wet meadows increasing production and then folks wanting to run more cattle because they're increasing production. Has there been any more dialogue or have you heard anything more about kind of how they're being utilized Post-restoration. Well, that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. I mean, 
And one, one of the questions I had is if, and I wasn't really able to get a really firm answer, I would vary by the site, was whether whether or not rest had actually played a role in some of those great pictures we'd seen, had they actually rested the meadows. We weren't really, we didn't really figure that out for all these sites. And one of the things going along that question is those drift fences, they kind of, uh, they, the, that is, that is kind of the quintessential idea of, of cattle being in there and still trying to keep these values of the wet meadows going on. Whereas like the one rock dams, that's restoring what's there. Those, those, and largely the drift fences do as well, but that's that idea of working with cattle um, in these areas to, to try and keep that going. So that's answer. Yes, very well. Yeah. <laughs>